Today we're going to talk about life's top priorities. And you know, that may just sound uh, uh, shallow or insignificant to you, but it's an amazing thing how many times people are really, really applying uh, what the Bible says, but it is just not coming out like it should. And one of the things that I've learned, I've learned this first and foremost from biblical principle, but I've learned this from business, I've learned this from, from uh, being in a, in a medical practice, is that Learning to do things in the proper priority makes a world of difference in the effectiveness or makes a world of difference in how quickly uh, things change, how quickly things happen in your life. So I'll tell you, this is going to be an incredibly encouraging series. You're going to have some insights that are going to open up whole new worlds to you, and it's going to be a blessing to you. Your faith is going to grow. Every aspect of your life is going to get better. Listen, you can always get these for free anytime you want them at impactministries.com. This series is going to be all about getting the Word to work and bring life to your situation. And I've got a free download I want to give you. It's going to start you on this track. It's called Working for My Good. Be sure and get it today. Talking about life's priorities really reminds me of some teaching that I did in the School of Ministry and many times teaching that I've done when I've gone out and worked with uh, business people, teaching them how to build teams and this sort of thing and how to, how to manage time. You know, in managing time, the great uh, falsehood is to to think that time management is about getting more things in a smaller space of time. And when that's your approach to time management, actually you're going to end up worn out, frustrated, and, and uh, uh, just, just aggravate it because it's going to burn you out. Now remember, this series is not about time management. This series is, today, this message is about life's top, top priorities. But I think talking about time management gives us a good way to understand this. There was a, a, a teacher walked into a time management class and uh, um, he, uh, he set, you know, a big jar up, up on the table and uh, he put some rocks into the jar and and he asked the class, he put, you know, filled it up with rocks, asked the, the class if the jar was full. And they said, Yes, it is. And, and so then um, he proceeded to pour some sand into it. And the sand began to sift down between the rocks. And before long, the, the jar looked full. And uh, he said, so is the jar full now? And they said, yes, it absolutely is full now. And then he goes and gets some water and begins to pour water into the jar. And the jar fills up with water. And, um, and he says, is it full now? Well, <laughs> they're afraid to answer by now. But he asked him, he said, what is the lesson that you learn from, from this. And of course their answer was uh, that you can always get more uh, into the same time frame. In other words, we can always accomplish more. And uh, he said, no, the lesson from this is to put the big stuff in first. In other words, do what's important first and everything else can come together. You know, in, in time management and working with team building, and I don't do it much anymore, but for years I would do consulting with, uh, with leaders, ministers, businesses, and this sort of thing. And one of the things that we found is we found that people were always uh, busy, uh, or usually always busy, and they weren't, if they weren't accomplishing a lot, uh, we found that they were busy at the wrong thing. They were putting their time into the wrong thing. For example, you know, some people, we call them paper shufflers. People would come in and they'd start doing all the paperwork, all the busy work, when in fact they made their money if, if, they, if they had sales. So if they don't go out and sell anything, it doesn't matter if they got the paperwork right, they're not gonna make any money. And so, so it is with life. We tend sometimes to become spiritual uh, paper shufflers or emotional paper shufflers, and we put our time and our effort into the wrong things. You know, if, if uh, in that class, if they had filled that, that jar up with sand, they never, could have filled, they never could have gotten the rocks in. And so do the first things first. As a matter of fact, uh, many times Jesus would tell somebody you know, to do something, but he would say, first do this. I think I even have a series talking about the first things. Uh, imagine that, you know, somebody goes to the altar and they're, 
they're getting ready to give their gift at the altar. And Jesus said, and you realize that you, ha you have ought or you have a trespass against your brother. There, there's conflict between you and somebody. He says, now leave your gift at the altar. Don't, don't take it with you because if you do, you'll go out and end, up, and end up not giving. He says, but leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile with your brother first. Why? Because you need that reconciliation with your brother more than God needs that offering. And not only that, you need for your heart to be where, where when you're interacting with God, uh, uh, you get the optimal benefit because that's the, that's the whole goal between, behind so many of the things that we do with God is our benefit. It's never really for His benefit. So applying what is, <clears throat> applying what is true in the wrong sequence or the wrong priority can make it ineffective, and it can even, in some cases, render it to no longer be truth. Now, you've got to remember this about truth. Truth is not just about what is true. Truth is when that which is true is applied from, uh, the, from the right motive for the right reasons. You see, God doesn't just, want, see, legalism is just trying to do the right things because of how it will benefit you with God. Well, you know, when a person would, uh, would uh, forgive somebody else just because they wanted to be forgiven, or when a person would give just because they want to, to get something from God, any of these things we're trying to get from God for doing the right thing, that's the wrong motive. And in reality, they benefit us nothing at all. And in this series, you're going to understand how incredibly important motives are in, in everything that we do. As a matter of fact, understanding motives gets us, uh, comes right out of the character of God because faith begins with trusting God's character and God's motives. Once you trust God's character and God's motive, I want to tell you something. Faith becomes so incredibly, incredibly simple. And once you make the determination to do things for godly motives, it's amazing how simple life gets for you. So Paul gives us what seems to be uh, top priorities for effectiveness in this life. And basically, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says that faith, hope, and love are absolutely the top priorities. And most importantly, as, we, as we'll see in just a few minutes, Love is more important than anything else. Loving God, loving people, and loving yourself or having the right value for yourself. Now, some people get upset at the idea of loving yourself, but we're not talking about loving yourself in some kind of sick, narcissistic way. We're talking about having a high enough value for yourself that in the things that you do for other people, you don't violate yourself. You don't defraud yourself. You don't violate God's words. You don't commit trespasses. You don't destroy your self-worth. So, so you love people, but, but you never do it in such a way that diminishes your identity, your dignity, your worth, who you are in Jesus. Now, you know, Paul made an interesting uh, statement pretty much. I, I've condensed it down in 1 Corinthians 13 where basically says, without love, I have nothing, I am nothing, and I benefit nothing. In other words, if the things that I do are not, are not motivated by love, then there is absolutely no benefit whatsoever in it for me. And if they are done apart from love, it could have the opposite effect on the world around me, on the people around me, where, wherein I'm taking these steps. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've, I've become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. In other words, in other words even though I'm being all spiritual and everything, I, I really have, have nothing. There's, there's nothing of value in this. And then he goes on to say, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Man, that is a powerful statement. And, you know, in, in years gone by, you know, particularly in some of the Word of Faith, Charismatic, and Pentecostal movements, it's like if you moved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you could be rude, you could be obnoxious, but it was all right because you were moving in the gifts, especially, man, I tell you, back in the 70s and, and 80s, if a person claimed to have a prophetic anointing, then that justified them being rude. And, and people who 
consider themselves to be prophets. They were rude. They were harsh. They, were, they violated all of God's principles of communication. And, but they did it in the name of Jesus, and they did it in the name of their prophetic gift. And everybody just excused them for it. Well, you know what? You can't just leave out parts of the Bible, you can't, particularly the parts that say this is what's most important. Because remember, love is not just a mushy feeling. Love is about having high regard or communicating high regard, communicating value, communicating preciousness. So, so when we're dealing with God's people, we need to always be communicating value, even if we're rebuking them, even if we're telling them they're wrong about something, even if we're trying to correct them, we have to be correcting them because God values them, not because their mistakes make them unvaluable. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Imagine the people that just gave to get. Imagine the people that just give because uh, they, they think that that, that's going to give them notoriety or, or that sort of thing. Imagine people who make incredible sacrifices just because of some legalistic motive. They think they're obligated. They think they have to. Well, you know something? If love is not the motivating factor, people can give away their whole life and it will really benefit them nothing. You know, I want to, I want to make this journey with God in such a way that I experience life every step of the way. I want it to benefit me. I want it to benefit the kingdom of God. I want my life to benefit the people I encounter. I want my life to be a benefit, so love has got to be the key. I'll be back with the rest of this in just a minute. I've got an incredible six CD series for you. It's called The Secret to Always Winning, where we're going to show you what the Bible really says about walking in truth and love in a way that the Bible says will always be effective. See, we know that things are supposed to always work out for our good, but it seems like that just doesn't happen in real life. Well, I want to tell you something. I'm going to show you exactly what the Bible says to make things work out for your good every time so that you will know the secret to always winning. You know, sometimes when we, we start looking at love, we, we obviously look to 1 Corinthians 13, and we should, and we're going to look there today. But I want you to realize there's a whole lot more to grasping the love of God than just these characteristics in, in 1 Corinthians 13. And... Uh, uh, it's really key that we understand how God's love is expressed, how to recognize God's love, because Jesus basically talked about the fact that, that if we abide in love, we abide in Him. So when we're not abiding in love, we are not abiding in the Lord Jesus. I'm not saying we're not saved. I'm not saying that He's not there. I'm saying we're not, we're, we're not abiding in who He is. We're not abiding in the life that He gives us and the life that we have to give to other people. But let's just look a little bit at these characteristics of love. 1 uh, Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Man, I'll tell you, you know what? That in and of itself is, uh, is just monumental. Now, now, keep in mind that once we start understanding love, we have to determine, if this is, is this going to be the core of what drives my life? Is this going to be the central thing? See, you're going to pick out something that is your, the reason you do what you do. Sometimes it's to build a ministry. Sometimes it's uh, to, to help people. Sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, who knows what it is. Sometimes it's to get ahead in life. Sometimes it's just to get friends or sometimes it's to get people to love you. <clears throat> but you're, you're always operating from some motive. You know, every now and then, as a matter of fact, I asked somebody not too long ago, I said, look, I said, you know, things have gone wrong in your life for years and, and really, the way you make decisions, there's, there's some basic flaw in the way you make decisions because, because every decision that you make pretty much never comes out the way it should come out. And, uh, and I said, so what is driving your decision making? What, what's, what's in your mind? What are your priorities when you're making decisions? Well, the, they couldn't even tell me. You know what? I, I've asked a lot of people that question. A lot of people can't even tell you what drives their decision. If you don't know what's driving your decisions, and I can assure you this, it's going to be some impulse for gratification at that moment. But we've got to decide what is it that's going to drive the way I make my decision? What is it that's going to define my character? Well, 
You know, I would love to say I'm perfect at this, but I'm not. But I can tell you this. I did make the decision a long time ago that I wanted love to be the number one thing that would drive how I made decisions and why I made decisions. And, and, uh, and, and you know, ultimately from that, I started recognizing, and it, it takes time, you know, to get get this stuff alive to you. But I started recognizing and then that had to d determine how I talked to people or what I, you know, what I was saying to people. And so, you know, it's, it's not just what you say, it's why you are saying it because why you are saying it tempers every single thing that you do. You know, uh, when I was a pastor, every department had what was called an emotional impact statement for that department. Now, obviously, love had to be the undergirding uh, uh, number one effect that we wanted to have on everybody, but in different departments, you did that different ways. You know, back in the children's department, making uh, the parents feel safe about their children being there, that was a big factor. Uh, making the children feel inspired, you know, that was a, a big factor. Uh, so in, in every department, there were, there, you, you had to decide, how do I want people to feel? As we do what we do, as we minister to them, as we help them, and it's not, we've got to get beyond just what we're doing, and we've got to get into how does it make them feel. Now, you know, there's, there's been this tendency among people just to say, look, uh, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and it's up to you how you take it. And, you know, if you take it wrong, that's just your problem. You know, it, it may be true that is their problem, but if you have no intention to affect that person in such a way that they feel valued, then what you are doing is destroying. And, and you know, love is one of those things that you're, you're either hurting or you're helping. There is, no, there is no in between. You're either contributing to somebody's dignity and worth or you're taking away from their dignity and worth. And now all you can do is have your intentions right and, and yeah, they may take it wrong, but if your intentions are right, you're going to temper what, you're, what you say. You're going to temper how you say it. And when you m miss say something, you're going to go back and apologize. You're going to make it right because that's, that's exactly how love works. But I want to tell you something. This, this spirituality that just says you just, you just tell the truth and let it land where it lands. I got news for you. That right there is a, is, is a selfish, self-centered person who does not care how he or she is affecting other people. Because, you know, you speak the truth in love. And once you stop speaking the truth in love, you may be saying what is true, but it's no longer truth. Because remember, truth is when you take what is true and you apply it from God's motives. So, <clears throat> so you, you look at these characteristics of love and it says that love suffers long and is kind. So that's something, you know, you have to look at and you have to ask yourself, do I suffer long? Am I kind? You know, am I patient? It says love does not envy. You know, am I envious? Do I, do, do I envy other people? Am I jealous whenever other people succeed? You know, do I want what other people have? Am I content with life? Love does not parade itself. In other words, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to make myself look good. It's not puffed up. You know, I don't, you know, I don't get all, all filled with myself every time something goes right or every time I get something right, or every time I'm right or win an argument. R love does not behave rudely. Man, I'm telling you, whatever, everybody in the world needs it to get a hold of this. Matter of fact, the entire world does need to get a hold of this. And you know, one of the things that you're going to discover is this. Much of the condition of the world, as we escalate toward the Great Tribulation, much of what's happening in the world is happening because people are abandoning love. And so everybody's rude. Everybody's about themselves. Everybody's about their rights. And I want, I want to tell you something. Uh, it is this kind of iniquity, and that's exactly what it is. It's a lawless iniquity. It's abandoning God's values. It's abandoning God's morals, abandoning God's ethics that is bringing the world to the place of collapse. And this world will collapse. But I will tell you something, the people that won't collapse in this are the people who know the Lord Jesus and truly commit it to and know how to walk in love in every situation. So love's not rude. It does not seek its own. In other words, love is not, <clears throat> is not just seeking. I'm going to win. I don't care what happens to you. I'm going to do what's benef beneficial for me regardless of how it affects everybody else. You know, love 
<clears throat> love doesn't make itself a doormat. You shouldn't be a doormat. You should not be a victim. You should not be a codependent victim who, gets pe who lets people walk on you. That's, that's not love. And if you're doing that, I got news for you. You're not in faith. You're not in love. You're not in hope. You're not in the scripture. And you're really letting people destroy your capacity to walk with God because you're getting used, you're getting abused, and your self-worth is just going right down the drain. But, uh, you know, love says, says, I'm going to love my neighbors, I love myself. We, I mentioned this early. Love says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat you with respect. I'm going to treat you with honor. But I'm also going to treat me with honor and respect. I'm not going to be selfish. I'm not going to be out to get everything for myself. But I'm not going to destroy myself for you. It says that love is not easily provoked. Well, you know, I, I always used to hear this in marriage counseling, you know, where you got some abusive man or just abusive woman. It's like, well, I can't, ha I can't help it. I just love you so much that I get so angry. Let me tell you something. That's, that's not love. That's envy. That's jealousy. That's something else. It's, it says love thinks no evil. So love is not plotting evil. Love's not plotting chaos. Love is not plotting some way to bring destruction into this other person's life. It says love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Remember, iniquity is the abandonment of God's word. Love, love does not seek to do things uh, and ap apply things differently than how God says to apply them. Love doesn't seek its own values and standards and morals and this sort of thing. It says, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things hopes all things, endures all these things. Now, man, right there, some people have taken that and created a, a codependent mantra that, that has nothing to do with Scripture. <clears throat> you know, believing all things doesn't mean that I'm going to be a naive fool. It means that, that I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I, first of all, I'm going to believe all things that God says. I'm going to hope in all things that God says. I'm going to bear up under all things because I trust God. I'm going to endure all things because I trust God. And I'm going to project that onto the world. I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm not going to decide that I know everything as it should be. And I'm going to, um, and I'm going to give the, the people around me the benefit of the doubt without going into judgment. But I'm always going to trust God. It goes on to say, Basically, that love never ceases to be effective. And here's where this gets into the heart of, 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 of uh, what guides our life and what makes life work. See, we tend to trust force more than we trust love. We tend to trust intellect more than we trust faith. We tend to trust positive thinking more than we trust hope. And usually, we don't know the difference. We, we, we don't know the difference between, between force and, and love and, and control and intellect and faith and positive thinking. We, we, don't, we don't know the difference. We think we do, but we don't. Now, listen to this. In verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Love never fails, but where there's prophecies, they will fail. Where there's tongues, they will cease. Where there's knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part uh, will be done away with. Now, many people have taken this to say, see, this is saying that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to go away and, and, you know, uh, and all this. Well, if the gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to go away, then evidently uh, so, is, so is knowledge. And so we're all going to walk around stupid. Well, let me, let me tell you, this, this, that's not what this scripture is talking about. What this scripture is talking about is what is effective. When it says these things will cease, these things will be done away, basically we come to this understanding that, that these things, there are times when they are not effective. There's times, you know, when prophecy could be incredibly effective, but it's not always effective. There's times when bringing a message in tongues could be very effective. <coughs> Excuse me. Very effective, but there's times and places where it's not effective. There's times when any gift of the Holy Spirit could be incredibly powerful, but not all the time. But you know what? There's only one thing that's always effective, and that's love. Love never ceases to be effective. But we trust these other things more than we trust love. We're afraid that, it, we're afraid that if we walk in love and express value for somebody, they'll just, they won't, then, then they won't ever change. They won't ever see what's wrong with them. And, uh, and, and they'll never change and they'll always be harsh to us. You know something? That's just not the biblical uh, way to see this. We have to realize that when we walk in love, we're treating people the way God treats us. And they have the opportunity to experience acceptance. They have the opportunity to see something godly in us. And that opens up the way to minister to them and the way to help them. 
Listen, I got more to say about this. Come back for my mentoring moment. I want to invite you to help me change the way the world sees God. I want you to go to my website, impactministries.com, and discover what it means to be a part of the world changer family because together we are changing the way the world sees God. It's available at last, my new book, Apocalypse, A Spiritual Guide to the Second Coming. This is going to be the most practical, helpful book that you ever read about understanding how the world got where it is, understanding what's coming next, understanding how to walk through everything that comes with absolute victory. But more important than anything, it's going to prepare you for the second coming of the Lord Jesus. This is not about what I was going to go wrong. This is not about focusing on the devil. This is about focusing on the promises that says we can be an overcomer no matter what happens. Focusing on the return of our Lord Jesus who is going to usher us into the millennium where we're going to spend eternity with God. Listen, for everyone who pre-orders this hard copy, 300 page book for $24.95, I am going to give you a free eschatology course that's worth $149. And I want to tell you something, it's going to end all of your questions about the end time, about the second coming. It's going to resolve your fears. It's going to put you to the place of absolute faith. You know, Paul closes this chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 by saying, listen, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. But now, I'm not a child anymore. It is time to put away childish things. Well, you know, there's all kind of places that you can go to understand what this childishness might be referring to. It could be referring to self-centeredness. It could be referring to the way we see things. It could be referring to the way we act. But we know this. When you put away childishness, then you get your priorities in line with God's priorities. And you realize, according to verse 13 in this chapter, it says, Now abide faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Why is the greatest of these love? Because he just said that love never fails. Love never ceases to be effective. Now, <clears throat> you know, my, my good friend Ed Elliott, I've, I've heard him share this many times, where he talks about the reason love is greater than, than, than faith and hope, and that is that that, and I'm not going to go into all that he says about it, but basically you can't have hope and faith without love. Love is the core that makes every aspect of the gospel work. Whenever we are rooted and grounded in God's love, whenever we walk in love and we know what love is, when we experience love, then we are going to have faith. We are going to have trust for God because if we know that God is love, we trust His character, we trust His motives. So then in every situation, we're always going to have hope, a confident expectation of good things. We're always going to expect things to work out and, and the the amazing thing is when we know that God is love and when we are fully committed to walking in love, we are going to find that things tend to work out for our good without us having to be selfish, without us having to be fearful, without us having to be greedy. Things tend to work out. And here's the amazing thing. When we are walking in love, not only do we have faith and hope alive in us and not only do things work out for our good, but when we walk in love, we create a scenario where it's a win, win, win scenario. In other words, I'm going to come out all right, you're going to come out all right, and the kingdom of God is going to come out all right because the values of, of, of me, you, and the kingdom are all harmonized when everything we're doing is based on love. I, I want to ask you today to consider making the deepest commitment in your life when this video goes off that you are going to learn to walk in love.